Thank you. It's so great to be here. I hope you're all awake and you didn't have too much wine yesterday. Um, we're doing this in uh, two parts. So, uh, my name is uh, Carolina Kjellestad and I'm the head of the Swedish News in the south uh, of Sweden. And with me I have my colleague. My name is uh, Tuba Hansson and I work as an online specialist uh, at SVD in the same region as uh, Carolina. So, we are here to talk about uh, letting go of power and how to actually collaborate with the audience, or rather, give the power to the audience. As journalists, we often say, what's today's story? What are we going to do today? But we seldom ask the people, what's your story? As we heard yesterday, uh, it's all about perspective. And this is what our audience looks like today. Diversified, with many different stories, many different ways of life, and constantly online. So we need to, I think someone stated earlier, uh, yesterday, uh, earlier we, the audience came to us. Now we need to find the audience. This is us, um, the Swedish, news. Um, the picture you see is me and my other six colleagues, head of news, the national news and the local news working together. And we started talking about what is our mission as a public service. We need to talk about a different journalistic approach in our, in our work. I'm sorry. Um, because <laughs> In fulfilling our mission as public service and maintaining our relation to the audience, we needed to do something different than we already had done. An important step in order to maintain our relevance and our journalistic uh, relevance. We decided to let go of our power and actually let the audience take place in our journalism we decided to go crowdsourcing. I'm not sure how to do this one. Crowdsourcing has the potential um, to offer journalists more insights and information as we can ask directly from the people it's concerned. And the people who are in the position to know about the topic. Or as this slide plainly states, be the eyewitnesses to their daily lives. The web, the internet has lowered the, 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 sorry, the barrier for cooperation uh, in tasks that would previously been executed by professionals. It has therefore made it possible for us to access the audience in a whole different way. And Tuve will shortly uh, give you more detail on the actual work online, since most of it is done online. So how does it work? Well, it's actually quite simple. If you state the facts about the process, crowdsourcing is actually done out in the open. Transparency is anticipated to build trust and credibility. This notion can be hard to adopt in many newsrooms since uh, it requires a whole new way of thinking. You cannot and should not hide what you already know, and also what you want to know. So, talk about letting go of power. So in short, what we need is the eyes of the audience, them as eyewitnesses. Crowdsourcing allows the audience to be involved in a whole new way by generating the story, the idea, or the investigation. We also need the data and the information from the audience, usually by an automated interface on a website, so to speak, the help me investigate platform. And by requiring additional information like first name, last name, zip code, you get the uh, validity and you can ensure the verified users by their locality. And also, last but not least, we need their stories, but also photos and videos. We need their testimonies. Our first crowdsource ever, we 
started last spring in 2015. During four consecutive weeks in April, we wanted to investigate whether the possibilities to use broadband and surf the internet looked the same all over Sweden. Is there a difference in the north versus the south? Is there a difference in the city versus the rural, rural area? Since more and more of our authorities, our governments, and basically, basically all of our everyday life is based on the possibility to internet surf, using the internet, like doing homework for kids, this was also a democratic perspective on the matter. At first we actually wondered, are people really interested in this? It's kind of a dull question. But we were wrong to doubt the subject. The response to our questionnaire that we uh, showed uh, on our website was amazing. Stories from all over the country flooded in to us. All in all, we got over 80,000 people to actually participate in our crowdsource. And this in only four weeks. A huge success. And we couldn't believe our eyes. As a comparison, uh, the biggest crowdsource earlier had been by a Swedish newspaper called Svenska Dagbladet. And during a couple of months, they engaged only 30,000 Swedish people, less than half compared to us, and for a much longer period. So we were quite proud of what we did. So why not try it again? <laughs> Almost a pregnancy later, nine months, we decided to have a go again. Uh, this time for a shorter time of period, only three weeks. And this time with the housing market in focus. We wanted to know more about the housing market. What was the black, is there a black market in Sweden? How much rent do people pay? Is there a difference in where you live, how much rent you pay? Actually a subject that was well known for the uh, media, I would say, but seldom with the perspective of the ones that concern, the people living in their apartments, and so to speak. So it's all about perspective. We call it Bustad Sökes, or Residents Wanted. And who better to help us than the people in Sweden, sharing their experiences, letting us know what it's like, providing us with data, and of course their specific stories and experiences. In both our cases we realized we did not know the state of things, actually. And we asked the audience to tell us how it really is. So how did we access the audience then? How did we get their attention? How did we get them to hear us? Well, we actually used the traditional media in our crowdsource. We displayed our crowdsource in all our 21 local news shows simultaneously and with the national news in the morning show and in the evening show. Our hashtags were everywhere. Using cross-promotion then to our website, and our social media accounts, like on Twitter and Facebook. And I would say social media is vital. You can access the audience and establish a contact via your broadcast, but maintaining the dialogue and maintaining the contact with the audience is via social media and your website. Oh, sorry. Um, and we got reactions immediately to both our uh, crowdsources from day one, as I said. And it's easy to forget when you get a lot of responses and heavy data material that we will show you, that it's actually, this is what it's all about. It's about people and their stories, unique stories, that we hardly would ever have reached without this open process. Uh, I'm going to show you, or we are going to show you uh, some clips of all the stories, some of the stories that we had and the people we met, uh, thanks to our new way of working, partly collaborating the whole uh, of the national news and the local news together, and with our audience. And please note that one of these cases is actually uh, one of the winners of this year's Prisercom, the best news report.
basic knowledge, uh, basic technical knowledge, uh, like what type of broadband and how much data does your household use each day? And at first I thought that uh, these kind of questions may stop some people from doing the test. Uh, as you know, we only have a couple of seconds to catch people's attention. But uh, it turned out that I was wrong. Uh, 80,000 people did that test. So, obviously, it was not a major problem. And I think the reason was that people really felt that they had something to gain by participating. Uh, you want to know if your neighbor pays less or are getting a better broadband than you, because that, could mean, that means that you could save some money. And uh, I'm not going through the whole test, but I will show you a couple of the questions, just to, get, to give a feeling about what we do. So, the first uh, question was the postal code to place the participant on the map. And then we asked about the uh, uh, type of broadband uh, and the supplier, uh, and also the price and the cost of the broadband. At the end of the test, we left a blank space where the participant could tell their story. And that is a really important thing because that is the opportunity for them to share the story that could be our story. And this is what we get. This uh, is answers that came from this test. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's not that easy to navigate through a document with thousands of answers. And we, we wasn't, uh, uh, we, we don't, didn't know that it would be that much. So, at the beginning, I think at the local stations, we had some problems uh, to find what we were looking for from the beginning. And we had great help from the data journalists, and we got great stories from this data, but we also had a feeling that we may miss some other great stories. And that is one of the things that we learned, uh, the lessons that we learned from, for the next crowdsource, and we will talk about, more about that later. So every day the, the data journalists shared answers from that day with the local stations uh, and we chose what to use and who to contact. But every answer came to use, not only the ones that we did stories on. <coughs> this is uh, the map that uh, where you can compare your broadband to others in your area, and I will show you how it works. So, I am now I'm searching for my neighborhood. And here is all the answers uh, based on the postal code. Uh, as you can see, the most people were ILA uh, were quite satisfied with their internet access, and that is not that surprising since ILA is in the center of a, a bigger city, and uh, most of the problems was to be found at the countryside. This map is made by our team of data journalists. Here they are, they are all placed uh, in, at SVT in Stockholm, but they are working for uh, the local news also. And Robin is one of them, the here. Uh, but don't panic if you don't have a team of great data journalists to help you out. There is a lot of free online tools that can be used to create forms uh, and to handle the data. I use Google Forms, but that is just one uh, of the tools. There are a lot of other tools, maybe even better. 
And I also, there is also a lot of ways to learn the basics of data journalism, even if you don't have data journalists at where you work. I use uh, Facebook groups a lot, where you can ask people, and people are really helpful to share their expertise, uh, and uh, also instruction videos on YouTube to learn how to create a form for a uh, basic uh, uh, service. Um, <clears throat> this is probably the most important thing to keep in mind when you are working with a crowdsource. We are asking people to share, not to give. And they are sharing because they are expecting to get something in return. That could be to get to know if there is money to save, uh, that could also be to get uh, their story told, or just the feeling that we are listening. Remember three important things. Respond to the participants. Reward their efforts and publish the data. Uh, even if a story is not a headline by itself, you can collect a couple of uh, stories to show some of the people that already had responded. Uh, that might also, might also inspire other people to participate. And we also use social media to say thank you during the whole process. Of course, social media was one of the most important platforms for us during this work. To connect uh, the, the local news stations of SVD during this work, we had a common hashtag and we used uh, the same cover picture for all our Facebook pages and Twitter accounts. But it is a great responsibility to create a hashtag and to invite people to discuss. That requires that you have people work that can respond and take advantage of what is being said in that discussion. And it also requires that you have people working the hours when the discussion is going on. And do not wait for the audience to come to you. We search for them, for example, in Facebook groups related to the subject, uh, where we shared our work and uh, invited them to discuss with us. So, this is our second crossroads, the rent check. Do you rent your home? Answer a few simple questions to find out if you are paying a lot or a little in rent in relation to others. At the same time, you are helping us to identify what it looks like all over the country. This time, we have learned from the first crowdsource and we were taking care of the answers in a better way. From the start, we had a group with online journalists uh, working with this crowdsource. We had one online journalist from each region that was in a group that had daily media meetings, video meetings, uh, where they were sharing answers and uh, telling each other what the local stations was doing for the next days. And that way uh, the collaboration worked much better. And we also changed some other things, and now we will tell you a bit about that. vital for us, as we've stated, and it's also um, something that is setting new demands on us in terms of verification and digital uh, fact-checking. It is at the same time a golden era for us as journalists, as we can actually approach and be close to our audience. I would say crowdsourcing journalists is a rewarding and motivating process. For us, the journeys with One Sweden and Home Wanted or Residence Wanted um, has been a recognition that publishing can actually be, be the beginning of a journalistic process. But as in all working methods, there are ups and downs. The downside is obviously subject to manipulation, lobbyists and um, people wanting to uh, interfere, political or personal agendas may interfere in a crowdsource. And also the majority rules. A story only develops because users ask it or participate in it. 
And also the numbers that you receive, as Tuvi showed, uh, are hard to describe, uh, transcribe, sorry, uh, into statistical facts and figures. It takes time to make large Excel files into journalism. And there are also technical uh, issues to consider, um, such as validation of the interface and validation of the information. But why be sad when there's an upside? <laughs> Obviously, there's a community involvement uh, in this. Uh, we are a part of society, and obviously that is a big public service mission for us. We get more voices into our reporting, also a very important thing. It gives an opportunity, sort of micro-reporting even, uh, of events and development that normally would have been missed in the mainstream media. And there's also a transparency in the reporting process. That can be a bit scary, but it's also uh, something uh, that proves honesty in our process. And also it builds a valuable database of content that we can always return back to. You get information about a lot of people that you can visit again and use the database. So, what was the outcome? Well, as you can see, there was a huge success, both online and uh, in our broadcast shows. Uh, and this was an outcome of a collaboration of the local news and the national news together with the audience. And we are so proud of it, I would say. <laughs> and if we conclude this, um, crowdsourcing is still a new tool in journalism. And when used effect effectively, uh, I would say this is a unique way to engage audiences and gather information that paints a more comprehensive picture of the world as it truly is. And now, as a personal guide, you met her earlier, that was one of our planning editors, Helena. She will sum up, this time in English, uh, to give, and give you the top five tips from us on how to do this even better than us. I'm skipping that part, so. No, sorry. Here we go. Real people, not the authorities, give you the best stories. Find the people, their specific story in your crowdsource. Everyone remembers the man on the roof with his cell phone. Few remembers the numbers and the charts we show. Make sure you schedule your stuff right. Do not underestimate the need of people answering and moderating the questions and input from the audience. Decide your hashtag, decide your means of communication with the audience, whether it's via Facebook, Twitter, or other social media. Make sure you market and promote your crowdsource in your traditional media. Market it as often <coughs> as you can in your broadcast news shows. What's in it for me? Think through the means of payoff for the audience. If you want the audience to give you information, give something back. There has to be an obvious benefit. Payoff is the key. Show people stories in your broadcast. Mention the help you get. Choose your subject carefully. Choose your perspective. Let go of your journalistic pride and power. Ask the audience for help, and the audience will love you back. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, first, I will ask uh, Anthony while we are waiting for questions. Anthony and Robin to go out and prepare. And meanwhile, I have one question. If uh, anybody else don't, do you already prepare some new crowdsourcing? Can you say us? We're just exhaling from the, uh, <laughs> the last one. Uh, but I think this is a process that we have to consider doing relatively often because the, the benefit and the outcome of it is, uh, is, is too good to slip through. So we, we, we need to use it more often. But maybe in a, lo in a smaller scale also. Just all right, so they can prepare. And another question again. Uh, do you think that you would have uh, also st strategy inside company how to choose those, th those uh, stories, questions and so on? Because last one was uh, choose carefully. 
uh, you mean the, the... What kind of questions you think you can ask? What kind of questions shouldn't be asked, for example? Well, I think we all, we, in, all, in, all, in all of this we have to consider uh, the perspective and, and the questions. And I think there, there's, there's a, there's, it's hard to ask the people maybe to investigate, uh, do the investigation in, in, uh, in, in different criminal cases maybe, but I think you, you need to have a broad question and in that and you can sort of tighten what you want to show in, in your broadcast and, and in your news reports. You need a broad a broad question, like what do you pay for, how is, how is the housing market? It's a broad question, then you can sort of narrow it down in different reports. I have a question. In this conversation you have with the audience, don't you have people uh, who uh, are disappointed because they, you're not able to cover their stories and you receive complaints if they not fulfill their uh, expectations from you? I don't know. We have not have, had any negative response uh, from, from the audience actually. And we use, since our broadcast shows that's limited amount of time, but on the, on the website you can actually uh, show the stories in a short, shorter format, but obviously we couldn't show all of, all of the stories. 80,000 people, that's a lot. You cannot show that. But, um, but mostly I think it's, it's, it's important that you say thank you, and we heard your story, and your story is sort of the base to, to the other stories that we're telling. So they're contribu contributing, but uh, not in a, in, a, in a news report maybe. So, but no, no negative. Yeah, sure. Hi. Hi. Um, do you think it could be possible to have uh, the big questions you're dealing with coming from the public? You know, because you think about uh, rent, you think about uh, you know phone, etc. But is it possible? You think that those questions could come directly from the public, from the viewers? Of course. Uh, I think that's uh, maybe that's the next step because. Uh, it's a big benefit if it comes from from the audience because then it's a it's a it's a question that's important for them and has a big relevance. So I would say that that's a, that's a good way of thinking. And usually we have sort of a, a not so narrow question. So maybe if you ask how what is the housing market like, and then maybe you get some influence from the audience, and then you do a news report on the black market or something else. But that's a, that's a good question and. I think that's uh, something you can actually use the audience to, to get relevance in your user play. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and, and one question here. Uh, how did the name crowdsourcing came up? <laughs> well, you put me on the spot there. I don't. I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure uh, actually because I think it's a uh, it's a common <laughs> term. We didn't invent it. We did not invent the the, the term. Uh, it's considered um, a journalistic term, so... Thank you once more for inspiring the presentation.